Notion offers a widely beneficial destination for the information that you share with your clients. With it, you can give your clients just a single URL that they can bookmark, and then they can rely on them just that one bookmark to access all of the information that you share. Notion offers a pleasing professional interface that's intuitive for all users. And you can share virtually any type of content from stored files and multimedia to original documents that you create directly within Notion to sophisticated databases and project management mechanisms. And Notion also helps you to keep your clients focused and accountable for any information that they may owe you. And you can also use Notion to collect feedback from your clients and collaborate with them in other ways. So of course, every business engages with its clients differently and shares different types of information. So today we're gonna to explore a sample workspace that contains a client portal with information that's really universally applicable. It contains information that I use with virtually every type of client that I work with, regardless of their industry or the nature of the work that I'm doing for them. And to complement this video, there's a text post on Notion VIP that offers sort of a step-by-step -step guide to some of the practices that we'll be exploring today. That will be linked within the description of this video on YouTube. So in a previous video, I explored this notion of a bulletproof workspace. And the bulletproof workspace is sort of a methodology that I put together based on my foremost recommendation for organizing any Notion workspace. And that is to centralize your information within master databases and then to create gateways for accessing that information. And those master databases live within a data page. And then the gateways for accessing the information are on a home page or a home base that contains useful perspectives of your master databases. And there's an independent video for that. As I mentioned, we'll include that within the description of this video. There's also a text post on Notion VIP for that, which will also be linked. It's easily accessible though at notion.vip slash bulletproof. So when you create your client portals, you can use these same core principles to create sort of microcosms of the bulletproof workspace. So your client portals are each going to contain two pages at the top level. They'll have a data page and they'll have a home page. So you can start by creating your data page and your data page is going to be where you store your master databases. You'll never engage with that page directly after initially configuring it, and your clients may not even know that it exists. Instead, you'll access your information, you'll engage with all of your content, your master databases through the home page. So when you create your data page, you can name it whatever you like. You can just name it data, or you can use some combination of your company's name, your client's name, and the term data. And you don't even need an icon for it, but I tend to use the database icon that's available at notion.vip slash icons, which makes it remarkably simple just to paste the URL of the icon into the page. So with the data page created, you can create the home page. And with the home page, you want to be a bit more particular about the aesthetics. You want it to have a nice polish because this is where your clients are going to be engaging with the content. So I typically follow this format of the client's name with the floating multiplication sign followed by my company's name. In the case of this example, it uses this fictitious company, Loggerhead Labs. And then for the icon, I'll typically use the client's logo, logo or the icon taken from the client's website. And the cover will just be a simple, not in any way overbearing sort of representation of the client's work. In this case, Liber Co. is a producer of cocktail syrups. So with your data page and your home page created, and you can store those really wherever it makes sense for your workspace. In the concept of the bulletproof workspace, they can be stored in the master resources database. That's what I 
tend to do, but you can store them wherever it makes sense for your workspace. With those pages created, you can begin to populate your master databases. And again, every business is going to have different types of information that they share with their clients, but these master databases in this example are gonna be pretty universally applicable. So the first of these master databases is a projects database. And in this instance, a project is going to be any sort of initiative that you're doing with or on behalf of the client. And this is a particularly useful master database because it allows you not only to display the projects that you're doing with and on behalf of your client, but it also helps you to uh, remain prioritized and keep your client focused. So for planned projects, you can schedule them and, as I mentioned, prioritize them. For active projects, you can display the progress and other helpful contextual information. And then for completed projects, you can archive them for future reference. So in this master projects database, you can see a handful of properties. The title property I've renamed to project. The status property is a select property with three options. It can be either in progress, it can be planned, or it can be complete. And then the timeline property is a date property where we've used dates and end dates to represent the duration of the project. These planned projects haven't yet been assigned a timeline. And then the sequence property is really useful here. It gets back to that point I made about prioritizing the projects because uh, if you're like me, then you work with clients who have a tendency to make project requests and then quickly get distracted and make other project requests and sort of lose sight of their previous requests. And uh, the next thing you know, you've amassed just kind of an unmanageable volume of requested projects. So this projects database is going to allow you to visualize everything in the pipeline for your clients so they can get a sense of the scope of their requests. And then by asking them to prioritize the projects or assign them a sequence, it also helps you to maintain proper expectations so that they don't think too much can be completed simultaneously in most businesses, if you try to do too much at once, your performance, the outcome of your work, the effectiveness of the projects is going to be reduced. Um, so you want to focus on just a few at a time. And by keeping your projects prioritized, you have the ability to, to work most effectively and maintain proper expectations with your clients. So then these remaining properties in the projects database are all relation properties. And these relation properties allow us to connect each project to elements of these other master databases. And by doing so, it allows us to create really useful filtered views of these other databases within the page content of the projects. And we're going to take a closer look at exactly how that works later in the video. <clears throat> But for now, let's move on to our next master database, which is the events and updates database. So in the events and updates database, I'll store calls with the client, video conferences with the client, in-person meetings, um, really meetings and calls of any type. And then also industry events such as trade shows. Um, so of course here you could use any sort of scheduled event that you're attending in conjunction or on behalf of your client that's related to the work that you're doing with them. And then within this events and updates database, I also include updates that I'll send the client. It's not necessarily an event or a meeting, but rather than sending just a long email, I'll nicely format an, a comprehensive update for the client um, within Notion and then uh, send them a link to the Notion page. And by including that update within this events and updates database, it keeps us uh, organized chronologically and it's easy to reference any, um, any past updates uh, sort of in their chronological context. 
So this events and updates database has fewer properties than the projects database. The title property is named event slash update because it's going to uh, include um, each event. And if it's an update, it'll be the title of the update. And then the category is a select property and it's got uh, different variations of um, these meeting types as options as well as industry conferences. And this sample doesn't actually include any of those updates, but uh, an update would be a category item here as well. And then the date can either be just a single date, it could include a time if it's a particular meeting, or it could be a date range with an end date if it's an event like a week-long industry conference. So within the content of each of these meetings, it will be helpful to include some contextual information. So each meeting is likely to include an agenda that's created in advance. You're likely to take notes during the meeting and then during the meeting or just afterwards, you're likely to assign action items to attendees of the meeting. So if we open up one of these meetings here, we can see that it's populated with those items. We have a table for the agenda, a table for the action items, and then a heading for taking notes. And rather than creating these elements with each new meeting, we can create a template that allows us to populate them automatically. So to do that, at the top of your events and updates database, you can click on the three dotted menu icon and choose templates. Now, because I've already created this meeting template here, you can see it, but if you hadn't yet created it, you could click new template to create the new template. So let's just edit this meeting template to see what it looks like. And when you edit it, you can see we're editing the template. We're not editing a particular meeting. I've just called it meeting. And then here is a table I've created. It's an inline table uh, that's a block type that you can select um, for the agenda. And then I've created the properties. Uh, the title property is the topic. And then there's a date property for the time slot. And then a text property to assign the leader of the topic that uh, that segment of the discussion. And then the action items you would assign during or after the meeting. The title property is the deliverable. You can enter the person responsible within this text property and then add any notes, which is also a text property. And then this notes heading is just a, a heading block type. So with this template created, when you go to create a new item within the events and updates database, what you can do rather than creating all of those items individually is you have this option to select the meeting template here and when you click it it's going to populate with all of those contents which will save you a lot of time and keep your information consistent so i'll just delete this new event and update so that's the events and updates master database. We can move on to the next one, which is the requests database, which I particularly enjoy. This is in the same spirit of keeping clients focused and accountable by creating a database for the requests that you've given your clients. You can reference it often and hold them accountable for the information that they owe you. And anytime they are indicating discouragement with <clears throat> your timeline, you can always point back to the request database and let them know that your hands are sort of tied until they have the information that you need to complete each project. So within the request database, the title property is requests. And then there's two select properties, one for status, one for urgency. You can choose a status of requested or delivered and then an urgency of high, medium or low. And then you can add notes to specify what exactly you need from the client. That's a text property. And then this projects property is a relation property that allows you to tie each request 
to a project. And as I mentioned, you can then include a filtered list of these requests within each project. And we're going to take a look at how to do that. So that's the events and updates database. Let's move on to the resources database. And the resources database is sort of a catch all for all the information you want to share with your clients that is not included in the other master databases. So that information might include multimedia libraries with photos and videos and other assets. It might include policies and procedures, testimonials and quotes from customers and the media. If you're working with an e-commerce store, you can include lists of products. If you're working with restaurants, it could include their menus. And you might also include tutorials such as for Notion or content management systems like WordPress. And then you can also include templates. So in this example here, we've included a template for a project overview. So for each project, you might include an overview and that overview might include background information, goals and KPIs. I often source inspiration from comparable projects from competitors. You can include a heading for that. And then, of course, a timeline for the project. And we're going to take a look at how you can apply this template to each project when you create the project. So this resources database is going to include, a, of course, a title property, which we've named resource here, a select property for the category. These will be specific to the nature of your work. And then you can include a checkbox property to indicate if that resource is frequently accessed. And you'll see why this is useful when we create our home page to display just the frequent resources first and then create another view for all of the resources. And then we have a files and media property here to attach files associated with the resource. And then once again, we have a relation property for the for the projects database so that within each project we can include a filtered view of the associated resources. Now within the items of the resources database you might have other databases. So if we open up this contacts item here it contains a database of its own. It contains a database of contacts and that database can be viewed in various ways and it includes various types of contacts. It, it can include members of your team, your client's team, as well as any third party partners that you're working with. And by displaying them in a nice gallery view like this, it kind of helps to build rapport among your team members. It creates identity behind all the emails being exchanged. And so it's not just useful in terms of providing phone numbers and email addresses, but it also helps to kind of bolster the rapport among team members. So the contacts database is one to consider. I like to store it within the resources database, but you could have it standalone as its own master database just within your data page. So before we move on to that home page, I want to talk about those inner contents of projects, which I've alluded to a few times. So we saw that template for a project overview and each project is likely to include some common elements. You might have a variety of uh, project types that you're doing for your client, but in general, you'll likely want to include filtered views of a few of your master databases. And that's why we use those relation properties. So if we open up this project here, we can see a few databases. We can see one with tasks, another for requests, and another for resources. So this tasks database is going to be a freestanding original database. It's not linked to any other database. It's its own new database created specifically for this project. And then the request database is a filtered view of our master request database. When we create this filtered view, we create a linked database block and choose the request database. And then we filter it to show only the requests where the project is this website 2.0 project, which is the one that we're working in here. So if we go back to our requests database, 
and look at this relation property for the project, only two contain the website 2.0 project. And those are the two that are gonna display within the contents of that project's page. And the same is true for resources. We filtered this linked database. This is a database that's linked to the master resources database. And we filtered it to show only the projects that are related to this website 2.0 project. And when you're not working with a massive volume of resources, I like to display them in this gallery view here and you have no card preview. That creates a really nice aesthetic. The requests, it's nice to display in this table view here because you're able to include those helpful notes. And then again, the tasks database is an original database. It's not a linked database like these other ones. And this is displayed in a list format with, of course, the title property for the tasks. It's got a deadline property. It's got a person property for the person responsible for completing the task. And then it's got a checkbox for indicating when the task has been completed. So this task database has another view. It's got a table view where you can see a little bit easier what these different properties are. So here's our title property. The person property is for the person responsible. The deadline property is a date property and then a checkbox property for the status. But if we're not actually editing those properties, I like to display that tasks view. So just like we did for that meeting template, we can create a, a template for the project. So again, the way to do that is to go into your three dotted menu here, choose templates. If you don't already have the template created, you'd create a new template, but we have this project template already in place. So if we click these three dots and edit, you can see all of those items here. So then when you create a new project, you're gonna to wanna to change that filter to reflect the new project. So let's take a quick look at how you would do that. If we click on new, and we can just call this dummy, and we can choose the project template. And when we do that, it's gonna populate with that new task list, and then it's gonna include filtered views of the request and resources databases. So we need to change each of those filters to reflect this new project. So we'll just change website 2.0 to the dummy project. And we'll do the same for the resources database. And so when we add resources and requests associated with this project, they'll appear here. But of course, we don't have any in place quite yet. So if we were to add them, not from the actual database, but from this linked database, they're gonna be automatically related to this project, which is helpful. So one other note before we move on to the home page, we do recall that we created that template for the project overview. And in order to use that template, we're gonna want it to appear within the contents of new projects. So we're gonna to need to edit the template in order to do so. So back in our projects database, we will go to that template, the project template, and choose to edit it. And right now, that project overview template is excluded from this filtered view of the resources database. So in order to display it, we're gonna to need to modify the filter and add a condition where the resource which is the title property contains project overview. So when we close this filter window, we can see that the project overview template is now displayed. So then when you go to create a new project, and another way of doing so is just to create the project option directly within this drop down menu. If we go to create a new project, once again, we'll call it a dummy project. And because we took that route to create this new project, we clicked the project template. This information is already in place. And we can see now that that project overview template is displayed within this filtered view of resources. So what you're gonna to wanna to do in order to use that template for this particular project is to duplicate it. And then when you duplicate it, you can open it 
eliminate the copy of text and rename the project text to dummy. And then an important step here is within the project property, you're going to want to choose that new project so that it will display in the filtered list. And then scroll down and we have another placeholder for the project name that we'll just call dummy. And so now we've created a version of that project overview template, particularly for the dummy project. So then if we open the dummy project, we have that version of the project overview in place and we can then modify the filter just as we did before. We want it to show only the resources associated with this dummy project and we can eliminate this extra condition that will show the template for the project overview. And now this is the only resource that's in place that's associated with this project. It is the dummy project overview. Now there are other ways of doing this. This was one route, but another route is just to create a template within this resources database for project overviews, which you could then select and then recreate for each new project. So as with many other tasks in Notion, there's multiple ways of accomplishing this, but uh, this shows you one of a couple. With your master databases in place, you're ready to move on to your home page. Remember, your home page is where you and your client are actually going to interact with the information stored in your master databases. It contains useful perspectives of that information. So if you look at the sample homepage, it only contains linked databases or filtered perspectives of your master databases. With only one exception, this little note here is a nice quote block that allows the client to send an email to a client or to a member of this team whenever they have a question. So the first of these linked databases is a link to the projects database. And this is going to display the projects in the list format. And the default view is going to display only projects that are in progress or planned. In other words, the ones that have not yet been completed. But there's another view here that offers a full list of projects. You can see here in this view, we can now see this new product email that has the status of completed. So this list is gonna show the title property as well as the status property. We can expand this linked database to open it as a page and then look at the third view, a full table. And this is gonna include the timeline for each project and it's also going to display that sequence property where the client has the ability to assign a priority to each project in order to remain focused and on task and most effective so the all of these lists and this table can be sorted according to the sequence So then we have a list of the resources database. And by default, we're looking at the all view now, but the default view is going to be the frequent view. And remember, we created a checkbox property to indicate if a resource is frequently viewed. So this list is filtered to show only the resources where that frequent checkbox is checked. So the list format works nicely here. These two lists arrange into columns, look really nice for the client. And with that frequent list as the default view, that'll probably be most helpful for the client. But then they also have the option to view all resources by choosing this all view. So this is going to display just the title property as well as the category property for each resource. So scrolling down, we have a linked database for the events and updates database. And this works best in the calendar format. So you can see here that we have all of those items that we created within the events and updates database. And this chronological view is helpful 
And remember, we populated a few of those items with inner content. So if we open one of them, we can see those contents already in place. We didn't actually fill out the content for this meeting, but we did put the framework in place. So the client has the ability to open up any of these meeting items and in theory, any updates that would also be in place here, as well as the events for the industry, such as these industry trade shows and see any of the information that we've included within it. This is helpful when you're on phone conversations with your clients rather than referencing old meetings in a list within a document, you have this really helpful chronological view. And you also have the ability to see upcoming meetings and then any other events that you may be in attending in conjunction with your clients. And then again, in theory, your updates would appear here as well. You can create views that shows just meetings, events. You could have a view just to display updates and that update view might work better as a list of updates rather than the calendar view, whatever works best for your client. <clears throat> And then the last filtered database here is the requests database. So in order to use this most usefully to keep your clients accountable for the information that they show you, you're going to want to reference this often in many of your exchanges. And it's good to have here on the home page to ensure that your client is seeing it often. So this default view is going to show only the requests that have not been fulfilled yet, but you also have a list that just shows this shows all of the requests including those that have already been delivered such as this one here you can see that this has a delivered status and then the table view which we've called details is going to include that notes property that provides all the information that your client needs to fulfill the request and then all of these are going to be sorted by urgency so again, it's very helpful to reference this request list often when communicating with your clients. And just in general, it's helpful to reference this home page often so that your client knows that it is kind of the mother of all resources for them where they can get all of the content that they need. And in that spirit, the last point is that you can take this single URL for your client to maintain as a bookmark and create a really memorable, simple version of it. I really like the tool Rebrandly, which is available at rebrandly.com. And you can use your own domain name to simplify any URL. So you could have your company.com slash client, for example, and it would redirect them directly to this homepage that makes it as accessible as possible for them.